Well, welcome to Impact Melanoma's Fall Melanoma Symposium. Um, for those of, us, of you who have joined us in the past, you know that we create these sessions to provide you and your caregivers and your loved ones with the most current information about some aspect of melanoma and melanoma treatment. Um, we bring the most renowned physicians uh, to join us for these conversations, and we always have an additional section that um, may be a melanoma survivor sharing a story, maybe some other uh, discipline talking about melanoma care. But tonight, we're very excited to bring to you this program on personalized medicine and technology for melanoma. Our speakers are quite wonderful. Dr. Aaron Farberg is from Baylor University Medical Center. He is a board, double board certified dermatologist and Mohs surgeon specializing in skin cancer, skin cancer prevention. And um, as a, a special presentation by uh, our a melanoma survivor, uh, Morgan England, who's going to share her particular story about um, her journey with a melanoma diagnosis. So I know that you're going to enjoy both of those um, both of those pieces of our program tonight. Um, I'm very excited um, to have our sponsor, Castle Bioscience, tonight. It's been just wonderful working with the team to bring a different kind of program to you tonight uh, that's not uh, specifically about a treatment for melanoma, but a, a, a particular genre of tests for melanoma. And we think uh, this is really um, very exciting information and uh, hopefully uh, you'll all find it um, impactful for your own treatment planning going forward. Um, uh, we love working with Castle. Castle provides tests that target unmet clinical needs along a patient's continuum of care. Um, and this uh, topic tonight on prognostic testing um, will be uh, very helpful for all of you. I'd like to share a little bit about, for those of you who haven't joined us in the past, I'd like to share a little bit about impact melanoma. We um, provide education, prevention, and support for melanoma patients and their families and communities at large. We like to think about a whole variety of our services and uh, under our theme, which is impact sun safe. 365. So um, we know, and we know that you know, that you need to be sun safe every single day of the year. But um, uh, we try to put together um, a number of programs across the country so that um, we can bring these services to uh, to many, many communities. So um, <coughs> Impact Melanoma's Practice Safe Skin Project uh, is, is about seven years old at this point. We provide sunscreen dispensers and programming for, uh, for communities all across the country. We have probably around 6,000 dispensers out uh, during this period of time. And we really use this as a way to build awareness about the importance of sun protection. Um, with that program, we have a, a really a, one of our brand new programs called No Sun for Babies. And this is a specific kind of uh, giveaway for parents who are still uh, have just delivered a child. And we deliver a, a bag of both sun safe, clo uh, sun safe clothing, blankets and um, educational material to start somebody's journey on the right foot. We know that infants require uh, uh, a different way of uh, interacting with the sun or not interacting with it than even your toddlers. So bringing these services is particularly important. Skinny on Skin is a very cool program that's been around for uh, several years. And this is our training program for beauty professionals, cosmetologists, uh, hairdressers, barbers, tattoo artists, to teach them how to look at new and changing 
lesions on someone's scalp, the back of their neck, because we know that some of those folks, massage therapists uh, as well, see somebody's skin more than their doctors do. So we, um, we've we created this program and trained thousands of people, uh, uh, professionals with this program and really um, just are so amazed by the stories that we hear from people whose, um, whose hairstylist finds a mole that um, may or may not be melanoma, but raised the awareness and potentially saved a life. Um, so, uh, we provide a program called S Safe Skin at Work, which is an outdoor worker program to raise awareness about how outdoor workers need to take care of themselves in the sun and how their employers need to support that. Uh, so um, that's a, a, a very interesting program where um, we provide education, sunscreen, and anything else that an employer would need. Um, one of our longest standing programs is Your Skin Is In. And this is our, our middle school and high school educational program. It's a totally program in a box. We've created this so that a teacher in any setting can use this interactive program to um, bring to their students. And um, this is a pro program that uh, also has a Spanish speaking edition. So um, if you uh, are a teacher and uh, have uh, are looking for a great way to bring sun protective awareness program to your students, this is it. Um, our newest program is called Impact Shade. We are looking at um, the intersection of heat, climate change, and UV, and uh, what that does for um, our skin health issues. Uh, and one of the things that we're pretty clear about is that um, while we talk about the need for shade and uh, in any any um, any guide that says how to protect yourself from skin cancer and melanoma, it always says seek shade. Uh, I'd like to say that there are many people around this country that would love to seek shade, but there is no shade where they live. Uh, and uh, we call that shade inequity. And we really are looking at what goes on in cities around identifying the areas in their cities where there aren't, where there is no shade. And those are very often areas where we have racial and social inequities at the same time. So impacts working with um, people from all uh, walks of life to uh, think through what we can do to um, impact the situation and help provide some shade in neighborhoods across the country that don't have it. So, um, and last but not least, of course, um, our, our support services. Uh, you'll uh, have a chance to ask questions of Kelly Braga, who's our social worker and manages our support groups, both online and in person uh, locally in Massachusetts. But we have a great um, we have great online uh, resources, both for support groups and for Billy's Buddies, which is um, a longtime program that helps us to provide mentoring for um, melanoma patients. We have some ability to provide some financial support for things that don't usually get covered um, from other payees. So that's a quick snapshot of SunSafe 365 where we believe that um, every day is an important day to protect yourself from the sun. So with that, um, and we'll be available for questions after, but with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Farberg um, to share his, his uh, information with us. So thank you. My goodness, no, that's quite that's quite the overview. It's an impressive one. It's uh, not every day that a group truly lives up to their name and impact melanoma. Uh, it's it's the incredible work that you all are doing, and it's a true honor to be here and presenting. And more importantly, I get to share this stage with uh, Miss Morgan England, who is going to be sharing her story uh, with with melanoma. I get to kick it off. We're going to be talking about personalized medicine and technology for melanoma. What's the outline? What's our schedule tonight? This is only an hour show, but please, if you have questions, submit them into the chat because we will have a, a time at the end to go over all this. And if you have even more and we need more time, I'll send you my email. And we can always talk on this. Um, I am a double board certified uh, dermatology and 
nose surgery. It's a special type of skin cancer surgery. I'm based in Dallas, Texas in private practice also affiliated with um, Baylor Scott and White Health System. Um, in between actually plastic surgery and dermatology, I dermatology residency, I did a full year where all I did was focus on skin cancer, particular to melanoma. Uh, so this is near and dear to my heart. We're going to be talking about melanoma just briefly as an overview. And then we're going to talk about you know, what I do and, and uh, with uh, me and my patients, how do we approach it? Um, and how do we manage it? And then we're gonna move on to some of the new prognostic testing. Although I can't even say it's new because it's been around for many years now. It, it's it's really just a, a way that it enhances our uh, uh, previous approaches and management to melanoma. It, it's really just become the standard of care. And then you have more importantly, the patient impact. Many of the people uh, joining us tonight have uh, unfortunately been impacted by melanoma. Um, and and, and uh, we're always working to uh, improve that impact, lessen the negative impact and improve the positive impact. So without further ado, let's keep clicking on to the next slide. Melanoma, most of you guys already know about this, um, but how do we name cancers in general? Well, they're named often after the cell type that just goes a little haywire or goes wrong. So if you think of like basal cell carcinoma, well, that's a cancer of the basal cell. Squamous cell is, is obviously a squamous cell carcinoma is that of the squamous cell type. So you guessed it. And don't worry, there's no quiz at the end of this, at the end of the, the hour. But melanoma are, is the melanocytes uh, that essentially, you know, grow out of control. Um, now, it's not the most common cancer. The basal cell and squamous cell are number one or number two. Uh, but the reason why melanoma is so important is because it is very dangerous and quite, in fact, it's quite deadly, uh, unfortunately. And this is when you hear about, you know, young people being diagnosed with a cancer and unfortunately, you know, not doing well. Um, oftentimes, it's because of this melanoma. What are the numbers we're talking about? About a hundred thousand. Oh, it's quick back, click back real quick for me. About a hundred thousand uh, invasive melanomas every year are diagnosed. What are our risk factors here? Uh, well, it's it's unfortunately a lot of good things in life, uh, or they feel good. Uh, UV radiation. I know it feels good to to maybe get a tan, but it's not good. It's a big risk factor uh, for melanoma. Also, if you have a number of moles, if you have a family history of it, if your immune system is uh, compromised in any way, of course, there's some interesting genetic uh, inherited conditions, um, but. Primarily, the most important one that we have control over that uh, that you've already heard about is sun protection. Uh, so we can all play our part, and it's important. You know, I'll throw in all my my tips and and uh, interactions with my patients. Oftentimes, I'll have patients come in and say, "Well." You know, I've already lived in Florida or here I am based in Texas. You know, I've already gotten lots of sun. What good is it now? Oh, it has a huge impact. If you can actually start using sunscreen now, even at 50, 60, 70, it plays a big part. It's the same thing that goes with smoking and smoking cessation. You know, even if you've smoked for 40 years, well, if you stop, it actually, there's great studies on both sides here to show that it does play a big role. Next slide, please. All right, back to the seriousness, melanoma. Uh, we talked about the 100,000 diagnoses, but what really also matters is people that are not doing well from this melanoma. And this is why, again, we're all scared and, and it really humbles all of us here. Um, we're having uh, up to 10,000 deaths a year in the US. Thankfully, you see a green arrow, it's going down. That's fantastic. What happened there? Well, science is doing its thing. We've got newer treatments. Immunotherapies are, are really the mainstay that uh, have had a huge impact uh, on melanoma at that time period. But unfortunately, you see that number creeping up again, right? We don't have a cure. We really don't. Um, we're searching for it and we're coming up with better treatments almost every day. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a constant growth or, uh, and, and uh, evolution of our treatments but you see the numbers are still going up. So there's room for us to have improvement. I wanna see that number get down to zero if we can. All right, so next slide. 
So now we have the diagnosis of melanoma, and that's what you see over on the left. And so, you know, I, I, it's it's a somber moment when I'm, you know, there discussing this diagnosis in person uh, with the patient. But now we're a team, and we have to figure out how do I prevent from uh, my patient having the melanoma on the left from progressing to something that you see on the right which is metastatic disease, meaning it's spread, it's come back, it's spread. And once it becomes metastatic, then it's, it's a whole nother problem. It's a lot more difficult to deal with and handle. We still have some treatments, but again, you know, the goal is to avoid that. And, and then the question is, is how do we avoid that? What do I do? What am I thinking? Well, I have this discussion with my patients and what we're really trying to figure out is what is their risk? What is their risk of having a positive sentinel lymph node? Because that tells me whether or not they need a sentinel lymph node biopsy surgery. Then I also ask, well, what is the risk of the cancer coming back? Either coming back right at the old site or coming back in the lymph nodes or coming back somewhere else in the body. I wanna know what is their risk of recurrence and metastasis. And that really drives what sort of management I have. In other words, if they're very high risk, well, I'm going to do everything under the sun. Get my corny dad joke there. Good. I love dad jokes. So anyways, I'm going to do everything I can to, uh, you know, prevent this. Now, if they're lower risk, well, then maybe we don't have to do all the other intensive management decisions, such as seeing them back as often, doing CT scans and imaging, or even doing any sort of extra surgery. So that's why it's it's important to measure risk. So important that the uh, national, uh, the NCCN guidelines, which is kind of our, uh, is one of our, our national guideline systems out there, really recommends personalizing our, our management for our patients with melanoma to each patient's individual risk. So next page, moving forward. So what are some of the ways that I figure out people's risk and manage it? It's called staging. And what we're doing with staging is we're grouping patients into various levels of risk. And uh, this is one of the uh, you know uh, usual versions. It's called AJCC. It's the American Joint Committee on Cancer. And it, it uses uh, how big the tumor is and how deep or how thick it is, how many nodes are involved, and then is there metastasis involved, right? Sounds pretty basic and, and it is, but it works really well. It's a TNM tumor staging. And depending upon how big it is, how many nodes, if it's metastatic or not, you get different staging. And so that's where you hear, oh, somebody stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, and the stage four is metastatic disease. You know, that's really, really scary. So you've got earlier stages such as stage and one and stage two, and those are even classified even further, right? We wanna get as personalized as possible is what we've learned. And so if it's early stage, then you see that there's various recommendations and you could be seen back every six months to every year, and then maybe you'll get some sort of extra testing, maybe you won't. Now, if you click one more, you could see, oh, this is, you know, more advanced staging. This is sort of a, a, a more worrisome, I, I'm worried about the patient's risk. It's much higher than if it were lower risk. And so what am I going to do there? That's where I'm saying I'm going to try to do everything I can. I'm going to do imaging. Now, again, how often do I do imaging? Is it every three months, every six months, every year? All those things can vary, and it really varies depending upon your individual risk. So moving on to the next one, and these are what we call Kaplan-Meier curves, right? I hope none of you ever have to really deal with cancer or have a family member that has to deal with cancer, but if you have or if you do, then you know what these curves are because what happens is that every patient that gets cancer is then put on one of these curves. And these are the various stages, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. You know, that's what all those different colors are. And what's happening here is that every time that clicks down, something bad is happening. And you can look kind of, if you turn your head to the side and you can see what it is, that's, that's melanoma specific survival. That means people are living or dying. And if you have advanced stage, like stage four or stage three, then you're one of those lower curves right? And if you're 
earlier stage, stage one or stage two, then you're at one of those higher curves. But these are all just generalizations, right? We want to figure out where each of my patients actually lies. Because sometimes we have patients that are on one of those higher curves that we think are gonna do fine, or they're supposed to do fine. According to the, the, the data that we have, they're supposed to do fine, but they don't. <sighs> but then there's other ones times where, gosh, there's, there's patients low on the curve. And you know we say, oh, this is a grim diagnosis and a grim prognosis, but they end up doing okay. And so that's where we're trying to always personalize and improve our staging systems. Next page, next slide. And this is the data that really shows that. More than 90% of patients with melanoma are diagnosed with early stage disease, that's stage one or two. And we're supposed to have a good shot at survival with those types of patients. But more than half of the deaths occur uh, in those earlier stage uh, diagno diagnosed patients. So what happened there? It's not that the staging systems are bad. It's simply that we're trying to individualize these patients. It's inherent to what we're doing. We have to, we call it binning, where essentially we lump people with equal risks together. But again, at the end of the day, what really matters is who lives and who dies. And if we can figure out which of those people within those groups really are at high risk or in at low risk, then we're doing the best things for our patients. Importantly, we know that if we can figure out those patients that are at higher or lower risk, we actually have things that can impact them, right? I love that. We actually have treatments that can help them live longer. And so that's why this is so important. Next slide. So now we get into gene expression profiling. That's one of the important topics. This is some of the, again, I can't even say it's new technology because it's been around for many years. It's really also the standard of care in breast cancer. It's also standard of care in prostate cancer. So it's used across the board. And thankfully we've been able to use it in skin cancer, uh, both in squamous cell, but here we're talking about melanoma for almost 10 years now. Um, what is gene expression profiling? Well, it looks at RNA. Don't worry, we're not going to have a biology or a genetics quiz at the end of this. But essentially, you have DNA, which is the textbook of all your genes in your cells. And then you have transcription. And what happens there is that you're transcribing the instructions into what do I really have to pay attention? What's on the test? What do I have to study for? From that RNA, then your body creates proteins. And that's what you actually see, feel, and do. And that's the actual functional organ and whatnot. And so what gene expression profiling looking, is looking at is RNA. RNA expression. What is your cells actually telling your body to you know, create protein-wise? And this can help us with diagnosing diseases. Gene expression profile can help you with prognosis. What do I mean by prognosis? Well, it's are you going to live or die? Is the disease going to come back or, or is it going to come back at, close by? Is it going to come back as a metastasis, that's prognosis. Um, and, and it can provide you this predictive information for, uh, for our patients. And that's where we have the test. It's called the Decision DX Melanoma Test uh, for patients with stage one to three cutaneous melanoma. And what does it do? Well, it helps us answer those two questions that I wanted to know with anybody that gets diagnosed with melanoma. What's their chance for a positive central node? In other words, should I proceed with that procedure? And then also what's their chance of recurrence? Because that's gonna drive my management. Next slide. So, uh, you know, here's how uh, gene expression profiling will work. You'll see somebody like me for your skin exam. We'll do a biopsy. Dermatopathologist confirms the diagnosis that's melanoma. And then I can order that test. And guess what? We don't have to do anything else. We don't have to do another biopsy or anything like that. Uh, the tissue is sent to the lab and then the test is run uh, through some pretty advanced uh, uh, systems. And they look at these 31 genes and then they can tell you the outcome, the result of your test. And we'll talk about what that looks like. 
Here it is. Just so you know, it's called also known the 31 GEP decision DX melanoma is the trade name. Um, but that's because it's looking at 31 genes. It goes through artificial intelligence, machine learning is, uh, is the technology behind this. And it runs it through this algorithm and spits out the result of uh, a number of different outcomes. And it, it's essentially different class calls. You have class one, which is low risk, and class two, which is high risk. But again, we always want to know more person. We want to make this more personalized. So it got even better. And so now it's 1A, which is really low risk, 1B and 2A, which is this intermediate zone. And then you get 2B, which is very high risk uh, for melanoma. Going on to the next one, next slide. But this is what's exciting about this technology and uh, what in particular Castle Biosciences I know has uh, uh, continued uh, to strive for, and that's improving uh, this test and making it even more personalized and specific. And so what happened next is if you look at the right two columns, essentially they're taking the score, that algorithmic score that the uh, test uh, out, uh, output provides, and then they're combining it with a variety of different factors, clinical pathologic factors, sort of like that AJCC staging had a couple of basic clinical pathologic factors. Well, this includes even more. You have things like ulceration, how big and thick the tumor is, the mitotic rate. These are just different uh, ways that we look at these cancers and, and tumors uh, to essentially grade them. And then what you do is you get your own personalized score. And you can see this on the next slide. This is what a, an example of a uh, test result looks like. And you can see you'll still get that staging at the top, whether it's class 1A, 1B, 2A, which is the mid intermediate, and then 2B. But then you're going to get your individual risk. And you can see across the middle here, your risk for living or dying from melanoma your risk for metastasis, and then also your risk of just simple recurrence. It's great to know that you may you know, live, but if you have a recurrence, that's gonna be a bad day too. And it's gonna mean extra work, extra treatment, extra management. And so all of these numbers are so important to me and my patients. Then you'll also in the bottom left there, you'll see what is, there, uh, what is the chance of having a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy? And that helps in my discussion with patients as to whether or not they really require a senolipno biopsy procedure with a surgical oncologist, or if it's something that, uh, you know, perhaps we should forgo. And so this is the type of report. This is the information that I really enjoy and get to, get to sit down with my patients. And I know my patients enjoy really seeing this data as numbers. Whether you're a numbers person or not, I'm a bit of a statistics nerd. I know it's very important across the board for patients in general to really understand what is going on. Next slide. And oh, by the way, speaking of being a nerd, there's lots of data out there. There's 30 plus, I think 35, 36, maybe even more now, or probably over 40 peer reviewed published uh, uh, papers, manuscripts, essentially a lot of doctors, a lot of scientists have gotten together and reviewed this data, have done multiple experiments, uh, multiple trials, uh, prospective, retrospective, combine them all together. All the good things that we want to see in studies have been here and widely published. And we know that this can impact how often we'll see, I'll see a patient back, whether or not I should get imaging like CTs or PETs, whether or not they should get a senolipno biopsy procedure, whether they should see a surgical or medical oncologist. We know that this, this test is able to impact it. Next slide. How does it impact it? Well, Going back to some of those studies, you can see that uh, this sort of information can impact about half the patients, which is incredible. Now, you can see that uh, if you get a class two, which is one of those high risk results, well, usually it's gonna end up almost 80% of the time with increased management. Now, if it's a class one, you can see it's changing management, again, about that same percentage, at least three quarters of the time. Now, why is it not 100%? because doctors still need to be doctors. We all still need to think about what's really best for our patient. There's not one thing out there that 
we all go by, right? So we utilize gene expression profiling. We utilize AJCC staging. We utilize NCCN. We utilize those types of guidelines to really figure out what is best for our patients and figure out what lab work, what clinical visits, what sorts of imaging, what our overall management should be for these patients. Next slide, yes. Now here's what's really cool. So if I could have you pay attention to one slide, it's this one and the next one, it's very cool. So uh, one of the biggest studies that you could ever hope to do is, is collaborate with the government, the National Cancer Institute, and they have this database, it's called SEER. Essentially, this is as good as we'll get of a national database. And what was actually done is we looked at with obviously the National Cancer Institute, does this test work? Obviously, I showed you all that other data. We know it works, but will it work and will it hold up to the string, uh, the, the most stringent, um, you know, prospectively collected data, which is a fancy term for, hey, it was done the right way? And the answer is yes. You can see that it stratifies, the test is able to stratify these patients into low risk, middle risk, and high risk, exactly as we expect. Now, if you look at the next slide, the question is, is, well, does that mean anything? Does this impact my patients? And the answer is yes. What we did here in this study is we compared patients uh, from the SEER database, from our government, of uh, those that did get a test run, uh, the 31, the decision DX uh, melanoma, the 31 GEP, and we compared them to patients that were, you know, nearly in the uh, matched essentially uh, in every way possible, except for that they didn't get the test. And you wanted to see, was there a difference? And you could see that patients that had the test ordered had a 27% chance greater of living over just three years. And their overall survival, now that's living or dying from melanoma. Now their overall survival, there's a 21% greater chance of uh, living at just three years for those that had the test ordered. Now, no, the test does not help anyone live any longer. There, there's no technology that does that. It's all the management. It's that discussion that, that I have with all of my patients about what sort of management should we consider? And it's those types of changes that lead to these types of results. Next slide. So here's an example of a patient. This is a melanoma. It's a 0.7 millimeter, uh, you know, not, uh, no other real high-risk features. Essentially what we do with this patient is we just cut it out and we move on. But when you layer in the information that you get from the gene expression profile test, this was a high-risk patient. Okay. So we know we can't just do what we were going to do, just cut it out and move on. So what we did is we, we cut it out and we considered doing a senolifno biopsy. Patient didn't want to go ahead with that, but instead they went with some more intense surveillance, more intense management. That's what I was talking about earlier, right? So they received a CT scan on a regular basis. And uh, the, the follow-up CT scan, they were seen every three months, but the CT do was done every six months. And at that six month follow-up, they found a metastasis, right? That otherwise would have gone likely unnoticed if it weren't for that imaging. And so they were able to image it, find that metastasis earlier, which means it's going to be smaller. And then they are able to be started on that immunotherapy, those new treatments I was talking about that actually impact melanoma. And so here's just an example of how this, this, I don't even want to say it's additional. This is critical information that we want for our patients can have an impact on them and save lives. This goes back and this is an example of uh, that data I showed you earlier showing that this test can impact lives. Next slide. Now, it's great and all to hear what I think about it and, and it's impacted me and my, my uh, management of patients, but well, what do patients think about this? Uh, there's a very nice publication in Cancer Medicine uh, where uh, patients were essentially surveyed about this information, this data, um, you know, receive those that had received the gene expression profiling test. And you can see the numbers don't lie. 90% of people, 90% of patients uh, would have wanted this prognostic information about their tumors. And 54% of patients that had had a, a melanoma uh, wish that, you know, they, uh, that uh, who did not receive testing, wish that they would have been offered it. 
right? And patients feel that it's useful, that they've gained a better understanding, whether it's high risk or low risk, right? That's sometimes the reality is, do we want to know that it's actually high risk? That can be a scary thought. And, and the reality is, is patients are saying that, no, we want this information, or if it's low risk, then it gives me peace of mind. So um, this is a really awesome article. I, I, I recommend you all check it out. And I think next slide, and we're at the finale. I've taken up too much time. This is precision medicine. The 31 GEP, the Decision DX, DX melanoma test, um, provides us precise information along with our, our staging and guidelines. There's lots of data, lots of patients. Over 100,000 tests have been ordered. You're going to see a change for our, our patients. And importantly, also it's covered uh, by our government. Medicare has gone through this data and said, wow, we want this for our patients as well. And that concludes my section. Moving on. And uh, now we'll get to hear uh, uh, Morgan as well. I'm excited. So I'm Morgan England. I live in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And in October of 2021, I was diagnosed with stage 3B melanoma. Um, so I had a mole on my right forearm that I, it's always been there um, as far as I know. And last summer uh, in uh, 2021, it started to get a little bit raised off the skin. Uh, just, it still looked like a normal mole, uh, but I noticed it changing. So I went to a dermatologist to get evaluated for some issues I was having with acne. And, you know, while I was there, showed the mole to her and said, hey, you know, I've noticed this mole changing. What do you think? Is it concerning to you? And uh, this dermatologist said, no. Uh, looks normal to me, but if it keeps changing, uh, you know, if you're in your concern, come back some other time. So, you know, left that appointment going, Whoo, you know, I was overreacting. Everything's fine. Um, then about another month went by and I uh, went to a different dermatologist at the recommendation of a friend uh, for, again, wasn't really concerned about the mole. It was more about acne treatment. And again, in passing, asked that dermatologist, hey, I have this mole, it's, it's now raised off the skin, um, and it wasn't before, does this look concerning to you? And he said, no, it's, this looks normal. It, again, if it, if it changes anymore and you're concerned, call me and come back. So this was in like August of 21. And in early October of 21, I was just doing some stuff in the kitchen looked down and there was blood just pouring down my arm from that mole. And, um, my boyfriend, he, he's a surgeon. And so he does have some experience with, uh, skin cancer. And, you know, he, he made a comment like, Hey, that's not normal. Uh, moles shouldn't bleed. So called that dermatologist back the most recent one I had seen and, you know, told them I, I had a suspicious lesion I wanted removed, took two weeks to get in. <laughs> Even during that appointment, um, the doctor was very dismissive and asked if I was sure I wanted it taken off that day because it didn't look like anything and I would have a scar there. <laughs> well, of course, I said, yes, take it off. And it wasn't five days later. I got a call from him on a Friday saying, hey, that came back stage two melanoma you need to have a bigger excision. You need to have a sentinel node biopsy, call a surgeon and get it set up. That was it. <laughs> uh, no, so no family history of skin cancer or any other kind of cancer. Um, you know, I'm not really, really pale. Um, I've always tanned easily and not burned when in the sun. I've always worn sunscreen, protective clothing when I'm outside. Um, I, I did regularly go to the dermatologist typically once a year, you know, maybe once every you know, year and a half, uh, I would say during COVID, um, kind of slacked off on going to the doctor because everyone's closed. We all did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, it had no, you know, no prior indication that that would be skin cancer. So you several times I found myself on Google looking um, at websites like Impact Melanoma, um, looking at the signs of melanoma and pictures of what they look like. And while I never saw one that looked exactly like mine, um, it did have this white kind of scab over it, which seemed to be um, consistent with several melanoma photos that I saw. So um, yeah, that's, that's what really, um, you know, set me off that it could be something more serious. Uh, one of the dermatologists that I saw, um, when I, you know, explained to them about the white kind of scabbing, they thought I had just gotten some like benzoyl peroxide on it or a cleaner on it, um, while in the shower or cleaning around the house. And that's, it was, it was irritation. <laughs> Now I kind of want to talk to you a little bit about um, the diagnosis itself, right? So you get that call on a Friday. Um, talk to me about, you know, what did that look like? How did you feel? What was your immediate reaction? Um, immediately, I was in shock. You know, hearing the word cancer at 30 years old is nothing that I ever would have expected. However, at the time, I didn't know a lot about melanoma. Um, I thought that all skin cancer wasn't really serious unless it, you, you let, let it just go for a really long time that you could typically just cut it out. And so I just, I didn't have a lot of information on it. Um, my doctor called me, you told me that it was melanoma. The phone call lasted about a minute. And that was it. I didn't have any other information. So I spent the you know, rest of that weekend Googling and finding out more about melanoma and that it really is very, very serious. And so it was scary having to navigate that sort of alone. <laughs> so you know, I had my initial consult with my surgeon. He explained to me you know, what the margins would be that he was taking and you know how the sentinel node procedure would work. Um, I would go in for my injection the afternoon before and then they you know did surgery the, the following morning. Um, but you know my surgeon was was fantastic, um, was very informative and kept me you know, up to date throughout everything. He removed two sentinel nodes or and one the first node that he removed had um was positive so you know that that moved me from stage two to stage uh I was stage 2a and that moved me to stage 3b uh which was you know without a doubt you need I needed some kind of uh treatment um to keep the cancer from coming back um so that, you know, guided my um, medical oncologist to put me on um, uh, Tafinlar Mechanist, um, BRAF inhibitor meds. And I, I took those for six months and I get scans every three months now, PET scans and a brain MRI once a year. So, um, I actually, it's a funny story. I met um, an employee of Castle Biosciences on a vacation <laughs> um, at the end of uh, 2020, early 2021. Um, I'm a scuba diver. Uh, this employee was on that scuba diving trip as well. And you know, told me a little bit about the company. I did some research on it and thought, okay, that's, that's really cool. Um, and then, you know, I get diagnosed 10 months later. And once, you know, throughout that first, the day one of diagnosis and things that kind of settled and uh, I calmed down a little bit, things got a little clearer in my head. I remembered, hey, Castle has a test for melanoma. So I immediately called my um, surgeon's office, talked to a lady up front and said, hey, I want this test run on my biopsy sample. And she said, absolutely. Like, we'll send it off next week. 
So your surgeon's office already had or was familiar with the castle melanoma prognostic? Yeah, they they were, um, but it, I had to bring it up to get the tests run. It wasn't something I, that they automatically did, I suppose. Um, so yeah, I'm glad that I had the information beforehand to have that test ordered. How did it impact your treatment, right? Or your journey, if you will, along the way? Mm -hmm. What did that result do for you? So, you know, my sentinel node uh, positivity percentage came back pretty high on my castle test, um, mostly due to being younger. Uh, younger people have a higher chance of having a positive sentinel node. And so that was at 20%, which um, if from other sample tests I've seen, that seems to be a higher number. Uh, so I was going into my surgery, I mentally was preparing for that to be positive. Um, you know, of course, others around me were saying it's going to be negative, like it's, it's going to come back negative. And I'm like, oh, I don't know, like this, you know, this test is saying it is a high likelihood it won't. Um, so I feel like it helped me mentally prepare for that positive result. But also the castle test, you know, there's different um, I guess you call it different stages. There's like a 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, um, where you're the worst that you can possibly be is a, is a 2B. And I actually came back a 2A. Um, so there are you know features to my melanoma that aren't quite as bad as a 2B. <laughs> so when I was feeling anxious or scared about metastasis, reoccurrence, things like that, I would pull that test result back up and look at it and saw that the numbers were way in the favor of not having a recurrence versus having one. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, what, what do you tell other patients who are in your shoes, right? What's your biggest piece of advice maybe for someone else um, who's maybe in a similar journey, right? A newly diagnosed patient, or maybe even a patient who's just, um, got some concerns, right? They, they think something's up. What would you tell them? For every, everyone that I, that I meet, um, I tell them, Hey, make sure that you're getting regular skin checks. That should be part of everyone's yearly checkups. You know, we go to our general practitioners, we go to women, we go to our gynecologists. Um, we have, you know, mammograms done, pap smears done, Having a skin check once a year should be um, advocated for more um, by you know, people's primary care physicians. When you know, people come in and it's like, when did you have your last colonoscopy, last mammogram? There should be last skin check. And if they you know, can't put anything or it's been longer than a year, they should, the patient should be counseled on getting that skin check done. So for all patients, everybody I come in contact with, I tell them, please get in with your a dermatologist ASAP and get checked. Two, if you have a, a spot that looks suspicious to you, have it taken off. Even if someone says that doesn't look concerning, just remove it. It, it is not that big of a deal. <laughs> just get it taken off. And to people that have already been diagnosed with melanoma, my biggest piece of advice would be do your own research, um, informed research um, on you know, dedicated melanoma, peer backed websites, um, get on you know, PubMed and read published, again, peer reviewed articles and studies. And lastly, get a lot of opinions. Do not just go to the first oncologist um, that you meet after diagnosis, even if you love them. Get at least three opinions. And my surgeon gave me that advice. He told me, get a local opinion and then go to a couple of bigger centers and get opinions from those people. And that was just amazing advice. And everyone should absolutely do that. So with that, we're going to go ahead and open it up to some questions. Um, my name is Rini Hedgman. I'm with Castle Biosciences. Uh, you saw me a little bit on the video with Morgan. First question is maybe for you, Dr. Farberg. Can you talk a little bit more about costs and the insurance um, 
you know, what does that look like for patients? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, it really it really stems uh, from the company Castle Biosciences. We're we're not talking about acne, although acne has a big impact too on people's lives. But we're talking about cancer, right? This is deadly cancer, and so I know that you know really from from the the. Uh, leadership from the company, they have decided that at any cost, they're going to make sure that uh, the patient or the clinician that's ordering the test is able to get this information. They're going to be able to order this test and cost should not be prohibitive. So they do have a very good patient assistance program. Um, essentially, it protects the patient uh, from getting these ridiculous charges or, 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 or uh, bills. Um, essentially, uh, the company knows how important this data and this information is. And so they're going to make sure that, you know, it doesn't come to any uh, uh, increased cost uh, to the patient. Now, for uh, most uh, uh, most Medicare patients, well, it is covered in, in most of those situations. Um, uh, but uh, essentially, it's... Uh, it, I always tell my patients, they may get what's called an EOB, an explanation of benefits in the mail. And that could be scary. You think it's a bill, but that is not a bill. Absolutely not. Um, and, you know, the company works with all patients uh, to make sure uh, that it, it does not, the bill does not impact their lives. Thank you. A couple more questions are coming in. Um, can you perform the test on a stage zero melanoma? Can it be done now? Uh, if someone was diagnosed and had most surgery in February of 2022. Yeah. So, you know, stage zero, or they're probably talking about in situ, meaning it's not an invasive melanoma. So melanoma has two different growth phases where it grows side to side. And then at some point it stops and it starts growing downwards. And then when it starts growing downward, that's considered invasive. Those are the more concerning ones. For melanoma in situ, where it's just growing side to side, stage zero, the test has not been validated for that type of melanoma. Essentially, you you have uh, you have such a small risk of really anything bad happening. There's just no real good clinical utility at this point um, to utilize the test. And so, um, from my understanding, is the company won't even run the test. Right? They're they're not there to be doing um, you know tests just for the fun of it. It's uh, it's only for those that have been uh, well invasive melanomas and and those that will actually change and impact uh, our management. Great questions. I have another good one. So um, can you do the test after a biopsy? Is it stored somewhere or does it have to be done at that same time that the biopsy is done? Talk to a little bit more about the process. Yeah. So the test is run on essentially the biopsy tissue. So the biopsy has to occur first, and then it gets sent off to a dermatopathologist, somebody that looks at it under a microscope. And then the diagnosis has to be provided. So that dermatopathologist says, okay, this is a melanoma. From there, the order can be placed and nothing else needs to be done. The tissue will be sent to the company where they do all the analysis on that tissue. So in other words, you don't have to do another biopsy. You don't have to wait around. It just needs to get sent over to them. And then that test can be run in that fashion. Um, Another great question. It usually takes about uh, three to five days to get the result. That's just the nature of running this test. Uh, you can't speed it up any further than that. What takes the longest sometimes is just the processing. In other words, getting somebody to put it in a, a mail slot and ship it, they all overnight it right away. So uh, it, it takes a little while, but uh, you should get results very quickly. Good. A uh, couple other questions have come through. Some of them are around, you know, Will my doctor automatically order the test? What do I do if they don't order these tests? I just had a comment come through um, that's kind of directed to Morgan, which is, you know, this is the, someone in the audience's words of, it's alarming that if Morgan hadn't heard about the Castle test and her MD didn't offer it to her, um, you know, what might've happened? There's probably more patients in her shoes, right? So do you have any words, maybe uh, Dr. Farberg, from your perspective of how patients can advocate for themselves. And then I'd also love to hear from Morgan, maybe on, on your advice to other patients like yourself. 
Yeah, I, I think Morgan said it best. Uh, get a second opinion, you know, either, or a third opinion, actually, is what she would said. And that is, I'd, I'd love to hear more from her on this one. Um, and I never take offense. And I recommend, uh, just as her surgeon had, uh, to say, hey, get another opinion, uh, because we know one doctor is good, two and three and four and groups of doctors are even better. Um, the reality is, is that we're practicing medicine, meaning there's not a simple textbook that we all read and listen and follow directly. And also every patient is different, right? And so it's different for every patient. It's different across the country, how we manage certain things. And so it really comes down to advocating for yourself, um, as Morgan had mentioned, um, and, and talking to as many people as possible and getting those other opinions. But I, I'd love to hear what Morgan has to say. So I can't necessarily fault my dermatologist for not ordering the test automatically. Um, he um, was more of a doctor that saw a lot of patients for acne. I don't think he saw a ton of skin cancer, you know, so, um, you know, I would say the best thing to do is as a patient, be very educated on what's out there. So you do know to ask for things, you know, in those type of instances. Um, and yes, get a second opinion. Um, absolutely. Uh, if, if someone was in the same uh, position as me going to a dermatologist that really specialized in, you know, Botox and, and acne treatments and diagnose, you know, them with skin cancer, I would suggest to immediately get a second opinion from someone that specializes in skin cancer. That's the only kind of patient they see for the most part, are skin cancer patients, because they're going to be up on all of the, the latest and greatest technology out there for skin cancer. Uh, Rini, I, I, I think one of the things I just like to pipe in to say is that um, we hear Morgan's story so many more times than I would like to say that we've heard her story. The number of people, particularly young people, and, and I don't know if this is particular to young people, that have been in to um, have something removed and uh, the doc says, I, I think it's okay. And so the, if the doc says it's okay, the patient says it's okay. And I guess the message is, my, my message to patients all the time is trust your gut. Uh, you do, uh, you know, the doctor doesn't see anything that you're not seeing, but you uh, know your body and you know what you can tolerate. And um, making that decision, uh, we worked with a, just, you know, a young man that had something that he didn't remove. He was a senior in college a junior in college, went off to a year in Australia, came back and had a stage 3B um, removed from his arm. Uh, so, you know, I think it's your body. You're the, you have to be your best advocate. Really well said. I've got maybe one more question and then I know that we're at the hour, so um, we can kind of wrap it up. But Dr. Farberg, I've got a patient asking if they had a biopsy three years ago, can the test be done on the stored tissue if there is even such a thing? Well, uh, you know, in general, the answer to that is maybe. Um, there's a little bit more specifics there. I would go and uh, ask and talk to the dermatologist that, done, that did the biopsy. The reason why I'm giving you a hedged uh, answer there is that, you know, the validation data is sent out or is is. Uh, up to five years. Um, and so, you know, is that going to change your management? Um, perhaps. And so it will depend upon some of the details there as to when the biopsy was actually performed, what the pathology report says. So it's worth asking the question. It just comes down to uh, what Tevin Morgan just said, you know, just advocate for yourself, get that extra opinion and, and see. Absolutely. I think that's about all the questions that we have. And again, I know we're at the hour. So I just, again, want to say thank you to everyone who joined us. We yes, did thank you so call, much. So it will be available, obviously, online uh, for future education and, and learning. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Farberg and Impact Melanoma, obviously, for letting us sponsor this really great event. And of course, Morgan, thank you so much for sharing your story. 
Um, hopefully everyone found it as impactful as, as we do. Have a great yes. evening, everybody. Thank you so much. And, um, Take care. Happy Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.